Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we might be able to finally answer one of the mysteries of the universe, at least in regards to the formation of very very large massive stars. In other words, we might be able to explain how all of this happens based on a new observation. Let's talk about this and welcome to What The Math. Now, some of you may already know the answer to this, but do you know what the most massive star that we've discovered so far is? And also, where exactly is it located? Well, it just so happens that, obviously there's a video about this sometime in the past where I made it a few years ago, but let's actually go there right now. If you were to look around the night skies, you would discover the uh, neighboring galaxy known as Large Magellanic Cloud. It's actually somewhere right there. And inside of this galaxy, there is a region that's essentially a kind of a molecular cloud. It's generating a tremendous amount of very large, very massive uh, stars, and it's also going to be one day responsible for generating some of the more beautiful and more energetic supernova. In this region, somewhere right there, is a star known as R136A1. To date, this is the most massive and pretty much the most energetic, bright, and so on star we've discovered. It's uh, possibly uh, over 300 masses of the sun and it's so bright and so powerful that we are not even entirely sure how massive it is. And I actually decided to dim it a little bit because it's just a little bit too bright. And the thing is, there are uh, a lot of similar stars in its neighborhood. R136 is a system of very massive stars that were created in a roughly similar uh, period of time and in a similar region as well, not so far away from one another. But the thing is, we don't really understand, or at least didn't understand, how exactly some of these more massive stars form. So in other words, why is it that some stars end up being so huge and so massive while others are more similar to main sequence stars like our Sun? What mechanism causes these stars to acquire such a dramatic uh, amount of mass in such a short time? And one of the main reasons we don't really understand how they form is because we generally think that all of the stars are formed in a very similar fashion. It all starts with a gas cloud that slowly condenses into a much thicker cloud, eventually forming uh, some sort of a shape that then ends up being a protostar. These protostars we've discovered quite a lot of. Here are just some of the images released by the scientists in the last few years, and there are a lot more of these, and they all seem to actually be kind of similar which in a sense suggests to us that we do understand the formation of stars relatively well. But there is a small problem. If these protostars become what we believe they become, essentially they turn into this type of a protoplanetary disk with a star in the middle that's about to become nuclear and start producing a lot of energy, we think that as soon as it actually turns into a star, and here I'm going to try to simulate this using Universe Sandbox, so as soon as this object here becomes an actual star, it starts generating so much solar wind and so much energy uh, that essentially all of the other dust and all of the material present around the star system will slowly start moving out of the system and eventually become completely ejected from it. That's our general understanding of how protoplanetary systems form and how they then go from this to a much more familiar star system such as, of course, the solar system. But then the question here is, if this mechanism works for all of the stars, how do some stars become so much more massive? What prevents them from losing the material and from basically uh, becoming small like our sun? What's making them continuously grow more massive, reaching sizes of 300 masses of the sun? That's actually where the mystery is. The mystery is, how does all of this gas still stay here and then ends up inside a star? And so to answer these questions, the scientists obviously have to look at something we've never seen before, or at least we've seen very, very few times. There's a very rare type of an event that we often refer to as the accretion burst event. We've only observed very, very few of them, and we were lucky enough to see just another one very recently. And in a nutshell, to try to understand how this event works and how this makes the star grow, imagine once again the typical protoplanetary star system. In many of these disks, uh, there is a lot of gas that still kind of circulates around the star system and is still attached gravitationally to the system itself. And once in a while, this gas reaches a kind of a critical mass where it starts suddenly flowing into the star. 
And interestingly, all of this mass is somehow funneled right into the middle where the star suddenly absorbs all of it almost instantly. In other words, even though we usually imagine the stars kind of growing gradually over time and acquiring mass relatively slowly, in reality it seems that most stars actually acquire their mass in very very huge bursts of mass suddenly coming into the star. And in many cases this burst continues over and over and over until the star reaches really large masses. And even though we've only seen very few of these events, the actual observations are always relatively similar. We seem to observe quite a lot of so-called masers, so sort of like lasers, but instead of visual light, they're produced in microwave light. In other words, they're only visible to radio antenna or um, special telescopes that can only operate in microwave frequencies. But technically, you can have a very similar concept to a laser in any frequency, and in this case, it's the microwave. And so what the scientists behind this paper observed was a sudden burst of masers coming from this particular system. And all of the modern models suggest that masers usually indicate a very unusual burst event. And the current explanation kind of goes as follows. So because there are a lot of various layers around the star, various material is still kind of there. As the burst occurred initially, some of the material started to propagate through these various layers, and more and more masers started to be generated over the following weeks. And as more masers were detected, this only suggested how much power this event had. And the only explanation to such a sudden increase in energy is if suddenly the star absorbed a lot of matter and generated all of these masers. In other words, this was an accretion burst that suddenly increased the mass of the star quite dramatically. And the scientists behind this paper also believe that there's probably a lot of different burst events all of which generate different types of energy and also all of which might produce different types of stars in terms of mass. In other words, some burst events will produce stars similar to our sun, but some burst events will produce something along the lines of R136A1. And all of this of course depends on how much gas there is around the star originally and on the frequency of these events, as well as the total mass that the star is able to absorb. We can try to see what we can generate here in Universe Sandbox by essentially trying to create our own burst event right here. And as you can see, this uh, whole energy that was released will now, as it travels through the protoplanetary disk, start emitting various masers that can then be detected on our planet. And as this happens more and more often, the star will eventually grow larger and larger in size. Although I guess for a star like R136A1 to be generated, a huge amount of these events need to happen relatively uh, in a short period of time, which of course means that a lot of gas needs to be present in the vicinity. Nevertheless, by discovering these uh, burst events and by seeing how stars are created, we are now in a much better position to explain how exactly all of this is created and why some stars are so much more massive than our sun. And although it's going to be a few years before we can finally confirm how all of this happens, for now we have to uh, rely on the current observations and of course on all of the data we've collected over the years. And once uh, new telescopes like James Webb Telescope become operational, we'll be able to actually see this in a lot more detail and possibly even detect actual collisions as they happen in more or less real time. But until then, and until we get better telescopes, we have to rely on the current understanding and current theories. But in that sense, we now might have a much better idea of how massive stars are generated. And this also, of course, confirms the general idea we have about the formation of stars. The idea that the stars do form in bursts, and some of these bursts are really, really energetic and extremely, extremely powerful. So powerful that we can see them from planet Earth, even if they're really far away. This star, by the way, is over 22,000 light years away, and we were able to see all of the masers that it sent toward us. But, unfortunately, that is all we know as of today. Once we're able to discover something else, and once we are able to possibly solve a few more mysteries of star formation, I'll make sure to follow this up with another video. But until then, check out the paper in the description below, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe consider supporting this channel Patreon because it does help quite a lot. Anyway, I'll see you tomorrow, come back tomorrow to learn something else, space out, and as always, bye bye. And one thing I forgot to do, and I'm going to do this right now, is give it a proper name. It actually has a name G358MM1. And um, unfortunately, this is the only thing we know about this star system. Hopefully in the next few years, we'll actually see more bursts coming from here, and we'll be able to learn something else.